Some of you know that we have a cute little uh, chihuahua dog. Now, I know for some of you, when I say chihuahua and dog in the same sentence, it sounds like an oxymoron because you have dogs that could eat my dog for a snack, like a little bone, right? You know, but nevertheless, we have a cute little chihuahua about this big, and he is a toot. And let me just tell you, he, think he, he thinks he owns the world. He's got a little bit of Napoleon syndrome. If he had a jacket, he'd put his hand in there like that. And he just thinks he's big and bad. And so we, we let him out yesterday to uh, do his thing out back. And we don't have a fence. Well, we had had a dog in the yard earlier that day, and man, I don't know. And, and my wife let our other dog out, and man, they just both took off. Now, I'm standing out back. I've got, you know, my shorts and t-shirt on and my flip-flops. And I see the, the bigger dog run, run, just run off and go around the corner and out toward the road, and, there, and there's the little chihuahua following, and I'm going, no! Don't die, little one, right? And so I'm running after this, the, these dogs, and I'm thinking to myself, the bigger one you're going to have to fend for yourself. I'm going to get my little chihuahua because he's my little buddy. And my wife thinks it's his. I bought it for her, but don't, don't tell her. He's really mine. So we're running around the front. Now, mind you, there comes this huge 4 by 4 Ford coming down the hill. And I'm like, stop like this. And so he slows down. I guess it was a he. I didn't even take my eyes off. Uh, looking where the dog was, and now I'm running after the dog. My flip-flop flies off. I got one flip-flop off running through the yard after this dumb little chihuahua, and finally he goes around to one section. I come up to him, and boom, he runs again. You know how that goes, right? If you've ever gone after a dog or a horse or something. So I get around to the backyard, and I finally get up to him, and when I got up to him, you know what he did? He lays down on his back, paws up in the air, and if you know dog language, what is that? Yeah, that's surrender. Exactly. Do with me as you will. Right? And, you know, his name's Brutus Maximus. In that moment, he looked like Wimpus. You know, I mean, he was just like complete, I'm sorry. You know, God has been chasing some of you in an area of your life. Not quite as frenetically as I was chasing the Chihuahua, mind you. He's never frenetic, but... But nevertheless, he's been chasing some of y'all. And, and you have yet to lay down and turn like this with your paws up and say, okay, God, I surrender. You've been holding on in an area of your life, and you have yet to say in that area of your life, God, here it is. You know, we have this, this sense about us that we, we can hold on to this or we can hold on to that as if letting go means we're destroyed, and it's just not true. Last week, we saw that God began... Jacob's education in the school of dependence. Remember that? We talked about dependence. Jacob had a dream of a ladder that went from earth up to heaven and the angels of God ascending and descending and God was at the top and the Lord spoke to Jacob and basically telling him, hey, I'm your resource. He gives Jacob some promises. And now Jacob has gone 20 years, 20 years away into a foreign area for him. It was his mom's family's area in Haran. And he's been there 20 years. And now in our story today, it's like God wants to know if Jacob had finally come to the end of himself. He's been in the school of dependence for 20 years. But he hasn't learned all the lessons he needs to learn. So are you ready to, you ready to fully surrender, Jacob? It's kind of what God's asking him today. So we're going to look at two action steps in our story today. Two action steps to become surrendered to the Lord. And the first action step is this, and we'll go right into the Word, but write it down. Learn to present your problems. Learn to present your problems to the Lord in surrendered prayer. Learn to present your problems to the Lord in surrendered prayer. Look at chapter 32, verse 1. Jacob went on his way, and the angels of God met him. And when Jacob saw them, he said, this is God's camp. So he called the, uh, the name of that place Mahanaim, two camps. And Jacob sent messengers before him to Esau, his brother, in the land of Seir, the country of Edom, instructing them, thus you shall say to my lord Esau, thus says your servant Jacob, I have sojourned with Laban and stayed until now. I have oxen, donkeys, flocks, male servants and female servants I have sent to tell my lord in order that I might find favor in your sight. And the messengers returned to Jacob saying, we came to your brother Esau and he is coming to meet you. And there, there are 400 men with him. 
Then Jacob was greatly afraid and distressed. He divided the people who were with him and the flocks and herds and camels into two camps, thinking, if Esau comes to the one camp and attacks it, then the camp that is left will escape. Now look at this, verse 9. And Jacob said, O God of my father Abraham and God of my father Isaac, O Lord, who said to me, return to your country and to your kindred that I may do you good. I am not worthy of the least of all the deeds of the steadfast love and all the faithfulness that you have shown to your servant. For with you, for with only my staff I had crossed this Jordan, and now I become two camps. Please deliver me from the hand of my brother, from the hand of Esau, for I fear him that he may come and attack me, the mothers with the children. But you said, I will surely do you good, and make your offspring as the sand of the sea, which cannot be numbered for multitude. And thus we read Jacob's prayer to God. Rooted in the promises of God. Do you see that in verse 12? His prayer is rooted in the word of God that had been spoken to him 20 years earlier where God had promised to bless him, to give him offspring, to make, a, to make him a blessing to others, to enrich him, and to bring him back protected into the land. And so this prayer that Jacob prays is rooted in, springing out of the word of God. The word that God had spoken to him 20 years earlier. We see that in verse 12. You know, in Genesis chapter 28, we had looked at that last week, when, when Jacob first encountered God with that stairway that went to heaven, that ladder that reached up to heaven, and God had given him those promises, Jacob's response was not an absolute, I will follow God and he'll be, he'll be my God. He said, if you'll remember, if you were here, he said, if, if... It was contingent on if God actually follows through, if he'll actually do it, then he will be my God, and I will give to him 10% of everything God gives to me. If he follows through, that is. The Lord took Jacob into Haran. After Jacob had that dream, he traveled on, went down into Haran, the place of his mother's birth. And Jacob spent... Seven years trying to get Rachel to be his wife. He worked for Laban. He wanted Rachel, the daughter. And daddy tricks him, gives him Leah. And so he works for another seven years to pay for the other daughter as well. And then he spends another six years for his flocks to, to gain some flock, a herd. And God just absolutely blesses Jacob for the 20 years he's down in Haran. Haran. And even though uh, Jacob's uncle Laban had cheated him numerous times, changed his wages in an attempt to get the better of Jacob, even though that was true, God still blessed Jacob, abundantly blessed him, just like he promised. But you know what? Jacob knew that his uncle Laban was really irritated with him. He got really scared. He got really nervous about his uncle and what his uncle would do. Because his uncle wasn't really the most trustworthy guy. And so Jacob conferred with his two cousins, now wives, who had borne children to him. A little weird, which is true. And he says, hey, gals, um, I think we need to split. We need to get out of here. And they're like, hey, what do we have left with our dad? Nothing. I mean, he's stolen from us. He's stolen from you. Let's, we're good. Let's go. And so, uh, so Jacob flees from his uncle Laban. He takes with him his two wives, Laban's daughters, all the kids. He, he takes a large uh, flock of sheep, a large herd of camels and donkeys and servants to care for all the possessions. And they just take off. And after about three days, somebody comes and tells Uncle Laban, hey, do you realize that Jacob took off three days ago? He took your daughters. He took all his possessions. Do you realize that? And verse number 6 tells us the report that comes back is that there is a problem. Because Jacob finds himself coming up to the place that is called home. And he's got this situation where he's interacting with Laban. God has appeared to Laban and said, hey, don't, don't touch Jacob. I'm protecting him. Don't do good to him. Don't do evil to him. Do nothing to him. You see that whole scene? And now you see in chapter 32 and verse 6, you've got a problem. 
And the problem is this, Esau, Esau is coming toward Jacob with 400 people. Here's Jacob coming back home. He can't go back to Haran. He's, he's burned the bridge with, with Laban, his uncle. And really, the only other place he knows is to come back home, back to where it's familiar. And the only problem is between where he's at currently and home is this guy named Esau. And you'll recall that the reason Jacob left to begin with 20 years earlier was he was running away from his brother who said, I'm going to kill Jacob. Esau was so angry, he had murder in his heart. He wanted to kill his brother Jacob, and now Jacob's coming home. He sends some people out to first have a discussion with Esau, and they come back and say, hey, he's got 400 guys. And they're coming to meet you. Oh, man, I'm going to die. <laughs> you know that's what Jacob is thinking. His response in chapter 32, verse 7, then Jacob was greatly afraid. He was distressed. He divided the people who were with him and the flocks and the herds and the camels into two camps, thinking if Esau comes to the one camp and attacks it, then the camp that is left will escape. And so he has a, a military action. His first response is one of great fear. He, res he responds with practical action in verse 8. Hey, let's separate it into two camps. If one dies, the other one will live and they'll escape. But then notice what Jacob does. His third response is to present his problem to the Lord in surrendered prayer. And Jacob's quite a mixed bag. He's been in the school of dependence. And so he still hasn't learned all the lessons. He's still got the practical side of him that he's going to make sure he gets everything just ordered so. To where it makes sense to him. But hey, he's making some progress. At least he comes back to God and begins to pray. And that's what we see him do in verses 9 through 12. Oh God of my father Abraham, God of my father Isaac, oh Lord Yahweh who said to me, return to your country and to your kindred that I may do you good. I'm not worthy. And he goes on. And then he says, verse 11, please deliver me from the hand of my brother, from the hand of Esau. I fear him. He's going to come. He's going to kill me, he says to God. Protect me. He goes back rooted in the word of God. He says, but you said, verse 12, I will surely do you good. So what's the punchline here? God, based on your word, I'm asking you for protection from my brother Esau. Please help me. It was a prayer of surrender. Jacob knew in that moment that everything he had ever schemed had come to nothing. Because in this moment, he was vastly outnumbered in terms of strong men. And if Esau, his brother, wanted to kill him, he had 400 men coming with him and he could do it. So sure, he enacted a plan, verse 7 and 8, but then he went to God in prayer, surrendered prayer. God, I actually need you. This is actually something that is too big for me to handle. I, I have no victory here. I have no way out of it. I can't conquer it. I can't fix it. There's nothing really that I can do. You said, God, you said that you were going to protect me. You said go do this and I will bring you. You said all that. And based on that, I'm asking you to come through. Because I need you to. I need you to. Let me ask you a question. What problems do you need to present to the Lord in surrendered prayer? Elsewhere in Scripture, Psalm 55, verse 22, we're encouraged to cast your burden on the Lord and He will sustain you. He will never permit the righteous to be moved. Some of you are carrying burdens you were never meant to carry. They're real, but you weren't meant to carry them. You're supposed to cast them over onto God. What a blessed place to be in. A place of, as we spoke last week, dependence where you surrender in prayer. Your problems to the Lord God here. I'm casting my burden on you. I'm asking you to sustain me. This is too big for me. I love this passage. What a comforting passage in Philippians 4. You know it well if you've been in the faith any length of time. Do not be anxious about anything. Yeah, but you don't, 
you don't understand. I mean, the circumstances that I'm actually facing, I get what Paul said there. In Philippians, I understand that. But you don't actually understand what I'm experiencing in, in this right here. But, he says, do not be anxious about most things. I'll give you allowance on the really big ones. You can be, you can be anxious about some things. Just those little things that you can't give to me, that's fine. I'll let you hold them. You can carry them. Is that what God says there? No, it's not. Do not be anxious about anything. 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 But everything, in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God in the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your heart and mind in Christ Jesus. You're in Christ. You belong to Jesus you have somebody who will receive the burdens that you cast on him. And you know what? He's big enough to carry them. You can't fix them anyway. So why worry about it? If you honestly can't fix it, why worry about it? It's dumb. I mean, just here you go. Surrendered prayer. Luke chapter 11, verse 9 and 10 in the New Living Translation, I, I quote this in the New Living because it actually gets the sense of the original language. I, and so I tell you, keep on asking and you will receive what you ask for. Keep on seeking and you will find. Keep on knocking and the door will be open to you for everyone who asks receives. Everyone who seeks finds and to everyone who knocks, the door will be open. So that's Jesus. And he's encouraging us to keep coming back to him. Come back to the Father in Jesus' name, casting our burdens on him, being sustained by him, asking the Lord to act. And he may not act the way you want him to act, but he'll act. He's working, and he will work. So let me ask you this. Do you have a problem you need to surrender to the Lord in prayer? Maybe it's a wayward child. It's giving you a headache, a heartbreak. Maybe you feel like you need protection. Maybe you live alone. And you, and you sometimes get nervous. And it's a really practical thing here for you. Or maybe there's a physical issue or emotional healing that needs to take place. Or financial, a financial crisis. Whatever that big thing is, that problem that Satan's using to beat the crud out of you. Why don't you just lay it down in surrendered prayer to the Lord and say, your will be done. Your will be done. We're looking at two action steps to become surrendered to the Lord. The first action step is to take, is to present your problems to the Lord in surrendered prayer. The second action step, and the last one is this, learn to lay down your plans. Learn to lay down your plans before the Lord in surrendered faith. Let's look at verse 13 on. So he, Jacob, stayed there that night. And from what he had with him, he took a present for his brother Esau, 200 female goats and 20 male goats, 200 ewes and 20 rams, 30 milking camels and their calves. How many of y'all want some camel's milk? Mm -mm -mm. 40 cows and 10 bulls, 20 female donkeys and 10 male donkeys. These he handed over to his servants, every drove by itself, and said to his servants, Pass on ahead of me, put a space between drove and drove. He instructed the first, When Esau, my brother, meets you and asks you, To whom do you belong? Where are you going? And whose are these ahead of you? Then you shall say they belong to your servant Jacob. They are a present sent to my lord Esau. And moreover, he is behind us. <clears throat> He likewise instructed the second and the third and all who followed the droves. You shall say the same thing to Esau when you find him. And you shall say, moreover, your servant Jacob is behind us, for he thought I may appease him with the present that goes ahead of me. And afterward I shall see his face. Perhaps he will accept me. So the present passed on ahead of him, and he himself stayed that night in the camp. The same night he arose and took his two wives, his two female servants, and his eleven children and crossed the ford of the Jabbok. He took them and sent them across the stream and everything else that he had. And Jacob was left alone, and a man wrestled with him until the breaking of the day. When the man saw that he did not prevail against Jacob, he touched his hip socket. 
and Jacob's hip was put out of joint as he wrestled with him. Then he said, let me go for the day is broken, has broken. But Jacob said, I will not let you go unless you bless me. And he said to him, what is your name? And he said, Jacob. And he said, your name shall no longer be called Jacob, but Israel. For you have striven with God and with men and have prevailed. Then Jacob asked him, please tell me your name. But he said, why is it that you ask my name? And there he blessed him. So Jacob called the name of the place Peniel, saying, For I have seen God face to face, and yet my life has been delivered. The sun rose upon him as he passed, Penuel limping because of his hip. Therefore to this day the people of Israel do not eat the sinew of the thigh that is on the hip socket, because he touched the socket of Jacob's hip on the sinew of the thigh. Wow, what a story. Jacob is almost 100 years old at this point. You don't think of him as a 100-year-old man. He's out wrestling with a guy. But he's almost 100 years old. And he's still scheming. He's learned some things. He's learning to walk with God. But it's been a slow process. And he's still scheming. We see that in the first part of what we just read. Let's separate out my flocks and my herds and my camels and all this. Put it with different servants and maybe I can appease my brother with all these gifts. So by the time I show up, Esau's kind of melted and everything's good. That's how I'll do it. You know, it's true that he's turned to the Lord and surrendered prayer and that's good. But he's also hatched a good plan. You know, Jacob always had a plan, right? Even as he begins to trust in the Lord in prayer and give it over to the Lord, he's still going to scheme and he's still going to plan. He's still going to try to get it worked out on his own. If his brother is still angry, then maybe his anger can be turned away with what I come up with here. So, I want you to think about this day. This day that Jacob puts his scheme, his plan into action. Can you imagine all the activity of getting all the servants rounded up, all the animals rounded up, divided up into all these different camps, and you begin to send them out one at a time, all day long, you're crossing all these animals across the river, all these people across the river, all day long it happens, and finally he sends his two wives and his kids, he takes them across, and then he goes back. And in verses 24 through 32, you see there in verse 24, that same night after he's had all this stuff, after he's taken his wives and his kids, sends them across, verse 23, and everything that he had, verse 24, and Jacob was left alone. Do you see that? Jacob, instead of resting, it had been a long day. Tomorrow he's supposed to be meeting his brother with 400 men coming at him. It had been a long day, and you know, it would be great to rest. But instead of resting, Jacob went to wrestling. He has a surprise encounter with the angel of the Lord. With God, we find out. And we know that it's a manifestation, an appearance of the Lord, because of Jacob's response in verse 30. Look what he says there in verse 30. After the wrestling match is over and the man leaves, Jacob called the uh, the name of the place Peniel, saying, For I have seen God face to face, yet my life has been delivered. Peniel means the face of God. And so Jacob understood his experience with this man who came to wrestle him. He understood his experience to be with a divine being, with God. And by the way, that's how the prophet Hosea understood it as well. In chapter 12, verse 3, In the womb, Jacob took his brother by the heel, and in his manhood he strove with God. In other words, he wrestled with God. That's how the prophet understood it. This was God, a manifestation, an appearance of God in human form. And notice, Jacob doesn't go and find the man. There's a man. He just shows up. He shows up and he starts wrestling with Jacob. God had a divine appointment with Jacob that day after an entire lifetime of wrestling with men and with God. God finally shows up and says, it's on. It's time for an all-night Wrestling match. Let's get this settled, Jacob. I mean, we have to ask, was this a pre-incarnate appearance of Jesus before Jesus ever became flesh through the womb of Mary? Did Jesus show up? Is this, is this Jesus showing up in the Old Testament? I don't know. 
It's a divine being. It's God showing up. Notice in verse 24 that this man just comes out of nowhere and, and after about a hundred years of Jacob's striving, here's this man to say, now you're not going to control tonight. You're not going to rest tonight. We're going to wrestle. It's a showdown. His life had been characterized by wrestling instead of resting. Now you look down at verse 26. He says, this man says to Jacob, let me go for the day is broken. In other words, here comes daybreak. And so it's time to let me go, Jacob. You've been wrestling with me. I've been wrestling with you. You've got a hold of me, Jacob. You're holding on tight, wrestling me. We've been wrestling all night. But I want you to let me go, Jacob, because the sun is about to break. And Jacob refuses. He senses the divine nature of the being that he's wrestling with. And he says, no, I'm not going to let you go until you bless me. But look at the blessing that God gives to Jacob. It's a bit odd. And you've got to wonder, how is that really a blessing? It's a blessing because God is actually bringing Jacob to a place of weakness. To a place of surrender. You know, yesterday we celebrated the eight-year anniversary for Gage becoming our son. So his adoption anniversary. And when he was a whole lot smaller, we used to have wrestling matches. He'd bring his stuffed animals and we'd have fun in the living room. And I'd let him jump on me. I'd let him bring his animals and he'd use them. And I would give him just enough resistance to where it was a challenge for him. And sometimes I'd act like I was going to pin him. And then just at the last moment, oh, man, you know. He pins me down, and he conquers me, and it was a fun time. Now I don't wrestle him. He's taller than me. I want you to hear this. Don't you know that the angel of the Lord here, this man that's wrestling with Jacob, don't you know that any time God could have crushed Jacob? <laughs> he shows up and enters this wrestling match with this human being, Jacob. And he allows the guy, Jacob, to wrestle him all night, God does. He even says, let me go. And he allows Jacob to tell him, no, not until you bless me. And don't you know that any time the angel of the Lord, God, could have just said, you know what? Pfft. Really? Are you kidding? Instead, he gives Jacob two things. God gives Jacob two things. First of all, he gives him a change of name. What's your name? No, it's Jacob. It's Jacob. He, God got him to repeat his name, to remind Jacob that his very name was a reminder of the type of life he had lived. Jacob means something like cheating, fighting. <laughs> so what's your name? Ah, cheater, fighter, wrestler, heel grabber. I mean, that... Jacob. Okay, well, I'll tell you what. I'm going to change your name. I'm going to change your name. That's associated with, with cheating and fighting and all this kind of stuff. You've been striving with man. You've been striving with God and you have conquered. You've had a lifelong wrestling match with God. I'm going to change your name to Israel. We're familiar with the name Israel. It's the name of a nation. But this man gets the name Israel. And it actually means he strives with God. So you go from cheater and, you know, fighter and heel grabber and all that kind of mentality and background to God give him a little bit of promotion. You strive with God. That's what Israel means. He strives with God. He fights with God. Why did God give Israel? Jacob, the name Israel, which means he fights with God. He strives with God. Could it, be, could, it, could it be to remember his lifelong wrestling match with God? You've been doing this your whole life, Jacob. He needed, Jacob needed to become a person marked by surrender instead of selfish ambition. Let me ask you, if God were to ask you your name based on who you've been, based on the characterization of your life. How have you lived? And how would you respond? 
What name would be descriptive of who you have been? Isn't it time to surrender fully to the Lord? What's your name? It's Jacob. What's your name? For some of you, it it may be your time to fully surrender to the Lord in salvation. We started off with the gospel. Jesus died on the cross for your sin, raised from the dead, and offers you his life. Will you surrender to the Lord and trust in Jesus as Lord and Savior? Confess Jesus as Lord today? That's the surrender you need. But you also need him for, uh, to surrender to him in your sanctification, your growth in Christ's likeness. And by the way, what was true of Jacob the man became true of Israel the nation. Because from the time of Jacob, who was called Israel, he strives with God. From the time of Jacob onward, Israel has wrestled and fought with God. So it not only described Jacob's life up to that point and that wrestling match with God, but it also described the nation Israel going forward. You're going to fight with God. You're going to be his covenant people, and you're just going to time after time after time strive with God. Your very name as a nation will be descriptive of who you are and what you do. And now remember, Moses is writing this book of Genesis to a people out in the wilderness. They've escaped Egypt. They're on their way to the promised land. And he's writing this book of Genesis saying, hey, this is who you are. This is where you've been. This is how we got to where we're at now. And you know what? Moses experienced Israel Striving with God time after time after time. It it was who they were in the wilderness. It was who they were when they got into the promised land. It was who they were when they split into two kingdoms. It was who they were when the prophets came along and warned them. It was who they were when Jesus showed up on the scene and they rejected their Messiah. They have always been striving With God, Jesus said this in Luke 13, 34, O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the city that kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to it. How often I would have gathered your children together as a hen gathers a brood under her wings, and you were not willing. Israel has always striven, fought, wrestled with God. How about you? Is there an area of your life where you are resisting the Lord in full surrender. Receive Jesus today. The gospel is for you. And the gospel is for you who are already in Christ. So he gives him a change of name, but he also gives him a change of mobility. Do you see what he does there? He touches Jacob's hip. He gives him a limp. Notice in verse 28... When God changes his name to Israel, it says, You have striven with God and with men and have prevailed. It's almost like God says, Okay, okay, no problem. You win. (laughs) You win. It's kind of like me with my son Gage. You win. But you're going to walk with a limp the rest of your life as a reminder of who actually is in charge. You're not him. I've let you wrestle with me. All these years, I've let you wrestle with me all night long. I've let you hold on to me till I give you a blessing. And one of the blessings I'm going to give you is this touch on your hip. And now you're going to walk with a limp. You're going to feel the pain all the rest of your days. It's a blessing. It's a blessing. Up to this point, Jacob had been healthy and strong. But part of the blessing that God gave to Jacob was weakness. Weakness. You want a blessing? Here you go. Here's some weakness. Everybody wants to be strong. Nobody wants to be weak. But God said, here's a blessing. Jacob was about to meet Esau, but it was going to be the Lord who took care of Jacob, not Esau. Uh, not, uh, Not Jacob. So he had this physical reminder going forward, this limp. Hey, I am weak. God conquered. You know, God was gracious and said, you've you've fought with men, you've fought with God, you've prevailed. But God really prevailed, didn't he? And Jacob needed God's power and protection. He didn't need his own manipulation. You know, God did a similar thing to the Apostle Paul, didn't he? 
God had saved Paul, and God began to use Paul. And Paul talked of a man that he knew who had all these wonderful visions of heaven, all these glorious things that he was not able to share. And in 2 Corinthians 12, it says this, starting at verse 7, So to keep me from becoming conceited, because of the surpassing greatness of the revelations, a thorn was given me in the flesh, a messenger of Satan to harass me, to keep me from being conceited. Three times I pleaded with the Lord about this, that it should leave me, but he said, my grace is sufficient for you. My power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly of my weaknesses so that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Listen, what Jacob needed is what Paul needed, is what you need, and that is to understand and realize and taste the weakness of who you really are. Weakness brings you into the presence of God in full surrender because you have nowhere else to go. You have nothing else to offer. If you come to God in your strength and you say, here I am, and some version of, aren't you glad? God's not really so much interested in that. What he's interested in is bringing you to a place of weakness. We need to be reminded that it's not our plans that are important, not our trying, but our trusting that matters. And church, let me ask you, are you truly surrendered to God's plan going forward as a church? I believe you are. Now, one of the things that really blessed my heart coming to this church was to know that you'd already been in discussion as a congregation on how do we go forward and reach a new generation. And you guys were serious about that discussion. You didn't know all the details. You thought maybe it happened this way or that way. You wanted to be more effective in reaching people in the community. You wanted to pass the torch on to another generation coming up behind you. And that is absolutely commendable. You know, it's one thing to fantasize and a dream. It's another thing to implement change. Uh, and so we took the contemporary from the Saturday night idea and brought it to Sunday morning. And that hit you where it hurt. And I'm so proud of you, in a good way. Because here we are, on a Sunday morning, in a new paradigm, and you're here. Not everybody's here that was here during those discussions, but you're here. And I'm grateful for you. I'm grateful for you. What if the Lord of the church is behind the scenes? May, what if it's not James? What if it's the Lord? What if the Lord heard your desires before I ever got here and began a work that maybe you didn't understand he was going to do? What if it's the Lord of the church behind it all? Now, I, I'll own all the mistakes. You can lay those at my feet. But there's been some good things that have, that have happened. What if the Lord of the church is behind that? What if Jesus is the change agent crafting and cutting and reshaping for Southern Baptist Church? I know it feels different than it used to feel. I know it is different than it used to be. And you're here. Are you truly surrendered to the Lord's will and purpose going forward? I'm not asking if you're fully surrendered to my will and my purpose. Because my purpose and will does, it doesn't stand the test of time. I've got feet of clay, and I am weak, and I don't see everything like I ought to see it. I'm asking, do you still have that same demeanor going into this? Four years ago that you had, you know, four years ago. Hey, God, do in our church what you need to do. Change us. Transform us. Make us the church you want us to be. Surrender to your will. You know, I could be... I could be gone tomorrow. I could die. Just heard of somebody in their late 40s passing away this last week, a gentleman. And I, and I say, you know what? <laughs> We're, none of us are guaranteed tomorrow or even the rest of the day. And so really, you're Christ's bride. You're Christ's church. Are you still with Christ? Church? If you will pursue unity in Jesus, then the Lord of the church will lead First Southern into the future he has planned for this church. One thing I've seen over the last almost three years now is, 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 is exactly what I kind of said when I first started. It's probably, I don't know, maybe my first or second message here. And I put a big old log on the stage, and I had different instruments, and then it turned in, I had the axe. 
And I talked about the edge of the axe, and boom, went down into the log. And I said, you know, if, if Satan wants to split a church, what he uses is the sharp edge of the tongue. And then we went two years with different people using the sharp edge of their tongue. Thankfully, we're almost to three years, and most of that's done. Got a little vestige of it, but most of that's done. And I realize change is hard, and I'm human. When I'm on the receiving end of change, I don't like it any more than you like it. When you're on the receiving end of change, I get that. But Satan always uses the sharp edge of the tongue. And it usually belongs to people who love Jesus and they think they're right. But if your sharp tongue divides the body of Christ, you're not right. You're wrong. And you're in sin. And you need to repent. Now, that's all on the backdrop of me saying, I got clay feet, I don't see everything I ought to see. And don't follow me predominantly, follow the Lord of the church. I preach this to myself. My wife serves in a different church on staff. She shares some things with me. I, we, we talk about, hey, even in that circumstance, you know, watch what we say as we're observing things. Are you still committed? Are you individually and personally surrendered to Christ to serve him as he directs you? And some people try and wait until they can figure out how their, uh, their perceived spiritual gifts will fit into this or that, and then they'll serve in the local church. But maybe God wants you to do something you've never done before, or maybe something you've not done in a while. There are many who have served here faithfully over the years, and during the interim without a pastor, you guys stepped up. Men, women, you stepped up. I came into a church that was filled with people actively serving, and some of you are now resting. And my challenge today is to get active again. If you're resting, get active again. Don't back off to the shadows. Do what the Lord of the church is requiring of you, asking of you for his kingdom advance in this place. It's a little crude, but some pastors say that people vote with their butts and budgets. So people, in other words, vote with, well, I'm, not gonna, I'm just not going to come. And keep their membership there. I'm just not, not going to come. I don't like what's going on. Or I'm going to vote by not giving. You know what? I don't approve of that. I might give to this special thing over here. But I'm not going to give. That's how I'm going to vote. I'm going to starve this guy out. You know anybody like that? That's, it happens in every church, by the way. There are students to disciple, children to lead to Jesus, committees that should serve as ministry teams to help the church move forward, and function properly. Offer yourself wholeheartedly in surrender to the Lord of the church and say, here I am, use me. Until the day I die, use me. I am your servant. Do with me as you will. And if you don't have that attitude, it's because you assume you've got a long time left. But what is your life? You're a mist that appears for a little time and then vanishes. I remember in the early 90s, I was, I was in my early 20s. I was a college student. I started off as a music major in college. And then over the summer, I was really wrestling. I, I felt like I should do something different. And so I actually looked at becoming a chiropractor of all things. I don't know why. Maybe I like popping my knuckles. But I, I remember at, at the end of that summer, and I'm driving back up to this Christian college, Clearwater Christian College in Florida, and as, and as I drove onto the campus, I'd been wrestling with God all summer long and, and the whole drive up, and I just felt this overwhelming urge that I needed to change my major, not leave the college, not go off and be a doctor, but to go back to school and change my major. And I remember wrestling with God on that, going, God, if I, if I change my degree to Bible, how in the world am I supposed to provide for a family? What do you do with a degree in Bible from a Christian school? I could see what I could do with music. And I'm gifted and talented with that. I, I can do something. But how am I supposed to? And I remember that was my wrestling. But I submitted to the Lord. And I went in, changed it, and the rest is history. God used that in my life to lay a good foundation. What is in your life today 
that God is, God is working on, and you're wrestling with God. If it's salvation and you need to trust Jesus, do it today. If you've got something with your time or your abilities, your talent, your gifts, your treasure, your will, and God is touching that area of your life today, submit that to the Lord. And you'll be glad that you did. You know, in your hymnal, on page 275, there's an old hymn that I grew up with, and many of you did too. Sing it with me. All to Jesus I surrender, all to Him I freely give, and I will ever love and trust Him in His presence daily live. Stand with me. And I surrender all. And I surrender all, all to Thee, my blessed Savior, I surrender.